Hello, my name is Travis Hallman. I am the lead administrator for the Ask a Libertarian Facebook fan page. I'm here at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas, Nevada with Adam Kokesh. Adam Kokesh is seeking the nomination of the Libertarian Party in 2020 for president. Adam Kokesh has agreed to answer a few of my questions regarding the Overton window and agorism versus party argument. The Overton window is a political theory that describes as a narrow window the range of ideas that the public will find acceptable and that states that the political viability of an idea is defined primarily by this rather than by politicians' individual preferences. Overton described a spectrum from more free to less free with regard to government intervention oriented vertically on an axis to avoid comparison with the left-right political spectrum. As the spectrum moves or expands, an idea at a given location may become more or less politically acceptable. Mr. Kokesh, what steps are you currently taking to push the public upward toward the more freedom side of the Overton window? Well. I have to start by challenging the premise of the question, as, as, as any good libertarian really should with, with any question I know, but um, I, I don't think that's necessarily what we need to do to achieve a free society, and the apparent assumption behind your question is that dissolving the federal government, that I, what I'm proposing with this platform, is outside the Overton window. And even though the, the definition of, of that ha is very precise, there's some subjective where are the lines of the window, right? And from what I've experienced from going out and, and traveling the country and talking to people, it's not like, oh my God, you want to you know, dissolve the federal government, that's crazy, that could never happen. Most of them say, no, you know, that sounds like a good start. And even the people who do object don't, don't freak out. I mean, if, if you want to say like it's outside of the Overton window that there are people who have uh, a negative reaction response to this concept, it's a pretty small part of the population. By and large, you know, people already are on board with this. I know you want to focus on the Overton window. Um, I, I think it's more what, we're, what, what I'm doing is not so much moving the Overton window, but revealing the full extent of it. So maybe that's just a rephrasing, maybe it's a little semantic distinction, but I don't think of what I'm doing as, as broadening the Overton window. Like, now we can talk about things that we could never talk about, but like, hey look guys, within, let me show you, within the Overton window, there's a lot of stuff that we can talk about that would bring about massive social change. I think that's an astounding answer, it's very insightful, and I think that I can rephrase my next question to be suiting to your idea. Okay. How should other libertarians work toward a free society as you have? There's two things, it's, and, and this is really pretty simple. One, change how people think, right? Change the paradigm. Win hearts and minds. Get people to understand. That's, that's the education of it. But that has its limitation. And a lot of us as libertarians, we want to think in the abstract, but we have to acknowledge that we're the exception to the, to the rule here. We're the, we're the nerdy ones, you know. We're the ones who really want to look into the look into these issues of, of social problems from this, you know, analytical, philosophical, scientific perspective. Most human beings are not like us, and that's okay. They're creatures of, of pragmatism. So it's how do we apply our principles to create policy that's practical for improving people's lives? And this is where localization is the answer that I've come to is the only real viable one through politics and changing. The, the political reality because it brings people together. I'm not going to fight you about what your idea of government should be. I'm not going to fight you about your ideology or philosophy or anything like that. Just if you're going to have government, if you want government, don't you want it to be as local as possible? Don't you want it to be in line with your needs, the needs of the community as much as possible as opposed to some corrupt, far off central authority? It's kind of a no brainer. We take government apart from the top down, we lose all the fat, all the waste, all the destruction, and, and, and abuse that happens inevitably as you concentrate power and you end up with more corruption. So how do we move forward? That's it, is, is decentralizing power. And I wouldn't be 
advocating for this if I didn't see it as the natural course of human progress anyway. I see what's happening in the world and all the secession movements that we have all over the world that, that this is the trend of people demanding self-government. Let's give them the tools, let's take the leadership and show them, hey, you apply our principles, here's an easy way forward for everybody. So that's working towards a free society by decentralizing. I'd like to ask you, is there a wrong tact for people to work towards a free society, such as offense, vile language, or violence? Well, I don't know if this is a loaded question or if I'm making too many assumptions here, but this is one place that uh, Arvind Bora has had a, a major voice in the Libertarian Party, at least, in terms of messaging. And I love Arvind. I think he's a great dude. I think his, his philosophy is on point. He's a passionate activist and a great speaker. But tactically, he is absolutely dead wrong. And I wouldn't say in a dangerous way, but yeah, in a counterproductive way to say we need to be inflammatory in a way that's going to push some people away to get the people who are ready. And I think that's based on a fundamental misunderstanding of how people wake up. Uh, and, and like even that term, wake up, like it's, it's not really accurate because you don't wake up and go back to sleep. You know, you cannot unlearn what you have learned and unsee what you have seen when you see government for what it really is. And it's a process. You know, for some of us, maybe, you know, you read one book or you watched my YouTube channel for a weekend and, and, and that was it. And you read some Wikipedia articles and you go, okay, I get it now. Good. But even, even for those of us who go through the process that way, and for me it was really 10 years, 10 years to go from calling myself a libertarian to understanding what it meant. So I, well, every time I remind myself of that, it reminds me to be really patient and really welcoming and really accepting. And I think we can be as much in people's faces as you could possibly be with this message and still be presenting in a way that's of universal appeal and welcoming to everyone. So when you have those two options, be more welcoming, be less welcoming. When you're trying to grow a movement, I think strategically the answer is pretty obvious. I would like to clarify, just to, just to, to be uh, sure, would you, would you agree with the next statement that there's not necessarily a wrong way, but there's always a better way? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, when you say like a way to wake people up, um, I know there is, a, I mean, there are, if your goal is to, to, to make libertarians out of non libertarians, uh, is there, a, yeah, it's never as simple as there's a right or wrong. There's a spectrum of, you know, most efficient to least efficient in the realm of counterproductive. So, yeah, of course. Okay, thanks for answering. Let's discuss agorism versus party archism. Agorism and party arc. I'm sorry, agorism and party archism are both libertarian social philosophies that advocate creating a society in which all relations between people are voluntary exchanges. However, they both have very different means. Agorists claim that such a society could be freed more readily by employing methods such as education, direct action, alternative currencies, entrepreneurship, self-sufficiency, civil disobedience, and counter-establishment economics. Party archists pursue a free society ends of voluntary exchanges through political parties via campaigning, voting, and holding offices. This includes the vetoing of unnecessary legislation as well as passing legislation designed to allow greater freedom. Would you describe yourself as more party archist or agorist as a means to a voluntary society and why? Well, this is really easy. I just get to reject the premise of your question again. It's not an either or thing. I mean, I'm, obviously, I'm definitely both. And if you're trying to say, what, what is my approach strategically based on? It's that we need both. Uh, you need the education. You need the, the embracing of, of freedom on an individual practical level to disempower the state, right? You need people to, to be agorists as much as possible to engage in, in counter-economics, to withdraw their material support. I've always been an outspoken advocate of that, not just because, hey, yeah, if people are trying to you know, hurt you and take your stuff, defend yourself and try to hold on to your stuff, right? Like, that's agorism. Don't let them take from you in taxes if you can just rearrange your economic affairs to avoid paying taxes. Absolutely, 100% on board with that. The problem is, that's not going to do it by itself. 
And I think a lot of people go, oh, oh wow, agorism, Konkin had it right, this is amazing, We're gonna, you know, this is going to move humanity forward if everybody just embraces this lifestyle. It's, it's easy to get carried away and make a couple of negative or incorrect assumptions that a lot of us make as libertarians, and the big one being that, that everybody thinks like us, right? And they, they don't. And agorism, I can prove, is not going to do it by itself because you look at American history, for example. You know, in the first American presidential election, it was less than 2% of the population that actually voted because it was white landowning males only. And the government didn't say, oh, shucks, we don't have a mandate. Let's just go home and go back to the Articles of Confederation. No, they said, screw you. We got a constitution or the government anyway. So even if you got 95% of the population on board with agorism, but 5% were like hardcore state is still... Well, they're going to be able to hire enough dudes with guns to go mess with the rest of us. So that by itself is not going to do it. You still have to directly confront the evil of statism and say, no, there is no consent, there is no legitimacy here, and not only are we going to withdraw our support, we're going to actively resist. We're going to, we're not, if you have a, a government supported by 5% of the population, and there's still, you know, you could, you could go and say, all right, well, we can't vote because we're agorists. We don't believe in that. But it's like, no, you just show up to one election and they're going to stop doing it because they're not going to be able to lie to cops and soldiers to say that, that they have the public mandate support to, to point guns at, at innocent people. That just goes away. So there is a point at which voting in a political system is a way to withdraw that public consent. And ultimately, I think that has to be the final step in how we get rid of statism. Because the alternative, and I could be wrong in terms of how this plays out, the, the alternative though is, is, is a collapse. And I'm, I'm not against that necessarily. We're talking about the collapse of an evil system. I know for all that's a good thing. But if there's a market demand, if it's better for everybody, that we have a peaceful, orderly transition, we should provide that. And if anything, you know, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. You really want to establish a free society. It can't be revolutionary, it has to be evolutionary. So, is it agorism or partyarchy? It's gotta be both. You're saying it's a combination of the two. Yeah. So let's break them down and discuss each uh, topic of agorism and partyarchy. The concept of counter-establishment economics is the most critical element of agorism. It can be described in the following way. The counter-establishment economy is the sum of all non-aggressive human action which is forbidden by the state. Counter-establishment economics is the study of the counter-economy and its practices. The counter-establishment economy includes the free market, the black market, the underground economy, all acts of civil and social disobedience, all acts of forbidden association, sexual, racial, cross-religious, and anything else the state at any place or time chooses to prohibit, control, regulate, tax, or tariff. The counter-economy excludes all state-approved action, the white market, and the red market, violence and theft not approved by the state. Mr. Kokesh, have you ever engaged in counter-establishment economics, also known as the black market? Every day. <laughs> Every damn day. No, I mean this is what, and, and the beauty of that is not. Well, here's the you know the, this economic analysis and that economic analysis, but it's that it gives you a sense of righteousness, right? Because we are so conditioned to feel guilty for not paying taxes, for not paying your fair share, or for not you know being being a part of the system. And you go, no, the system is unethical. You're giving them less money to kill people and hurt people with. Don't give them your money if you don't have to. Like that, that, that's the shift. And and I think once people get that, I mean, I mean, most people, most people are aggressive and they don't even know it. I mean, you go to the average American. Hey, did you go out of your way to pay any extra taxes last year? Like, you know, did you know that every every barter exchange of twenty dollars or value more, you can report to the IRS and pay taxes on that. You, they're not like jumping at those opportunities. You know, we're we're all inherently as humans, agorists, that we all want to do our business without getting messed with. So, yeah, once you realize that that's, of course, yeah, you do that all day, every day, you, you realize that like every exchange, that, that you know, every interaction, 
maybe it's not, you know, you're, you're, maybe you're not, you know, some drug kingpin, but just by, you know, I'm doing business with my neighbors instead of, you know, a, you know, a place where, you know, a store where I'm going to have to pay taxes. Just all those little independent conscious consumer decisions. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so how would you present the importance of counter-establishment economics with a party argue libertarian? Well, it, so it's like I'm, I'm now I'm arguing with myself. I'm going to argue as the as the agorist to the party archist. Okay, um, I think if you're going to succeed as uh, you know in, in, the, in the realm of politics as, as, as the party archist here, you have to have a critical mass of people who believe in what you're doing. Anyway, now. For, for example, to dissolve the federal government. We don't need to wake everybody up to libertarian philosophy, but we do need to get to a critical mass, whereas right now we're maybe 2% of the population to get us to, to you know, 10%. And I think having that ethical life that goes with it, I mean, these terms are almost an artificial divide. You know, I, I, like in, in the sort of anarchist minarchist thing, it, it's a really bullshit debate. Either you believe in the principle of libertarianism, you believe in the non-aggression principle, you believe in the, you know, that, that box that you check when you join the libertarian party that says, I oppose the use of force to solve social and political goals. You know, it, it, it's people of principle and people who are not of principle. And we can unite under the term libertarian. And, and the fact is, when you're a libertarian, you understand this principle of ethics at the heart of the message of freedom, you're going to live differently and you're going to look at government differently. So when you're living differently, it's not just like Democrats and Republicans arguing about you know, who do we point the guns at government at. You know, we get to go to the average status and be like, look, the grass is greener on the libertarian side. At least we pay a lot less in taxes. You know, I mean, just we live more free. We have more fun. We, we enjoy the freedoms that, that we want to enjoy even when government says you can. You know, we have, we are free in all the ways that you are not. You know, that's, that, you, you have to be able to live it. And, and in a sense, that's agorism, agorism, that's, that's living the message of freedom. Hearing that you support a combination of the views between agorism and party archism, and even more curious of the answer to the next question, if offered, would you accept the opportunity to present your ideas pertaining to more freedom on PBS, a government-funded TV channel? Oh, heck yeah, and I would drive on government roads to get there, too. Concise and to the point. <laughs> I like it. So, civil disobedience is the refusal to obey certain laws or governmental demands for the purpose of influencing legislation or government policy characterized by the employment of such non-violent techniques as boycotting, picketing, and non-payment of taxes. Mr. Kokesh, have you ever engaged in civil disobedience? <laughs> every damn day. <laughs> uh, yeah, I suppose every act of, of counter-economics, right, is, is a form of civil disobedience. But, I mean, specifically, you want me to tell all of my stories and be here for a couple hours. But, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty well known for, you know, being the guy who was dancing at the Jefferson Monument when government said we couldn't dance there and for loading a shotgun in, in Washington, D.C. And uh, actually, both of those as, like, classic civil disobedience, we're going to break the law with the objective of being changed, were very, very successful. You can go to the Jefferson Monument now in Washington, D.C. and dance without getting arrested. I know we have changed, not the law, but at least the enforcement policy there. And when it comes to uh, firearms freedom in, in, in the District of Criminals, the, the psychopath capital of the world, uh, you know, we, we've, we've made some progress there. And, and I'd like, like to think that, that my little act of civil disobedience there at least, you know, raised the conversation. Part of me feels up, uh, obligated to that minimum. Thank you. <laughs> How would you present the importance of civil disobedience with a party archie libertarian? Civil disobedience, when, when, well, to say that a, a party archaeist libertarian's objective is to build political consensi, consensuses, I should know that word. But, you know, if it's, whether it's around a ballot measure or around a candidate, you're trying to build a political consensus to bring about a specific political change. Well, if you're trying to change how people think, and you're trying to get them to think about the injustice and unethical nature of the state, civil disobedience is the most efficient way to do that when you have the right opportunity and uh, means motive and all that stuff. But when you have the chance to show 
like with the dancing protest. You know, we weren't, there was not an objective to get to a specific political consensus. It was just, we wanted to show that government is fundamentally violent. When government says, you can't dance here, it means that if you dance here, violence will be used against you, and thanks to the United States Park Police, we succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. If it was for a political consensus, like if it was, say, uh, you are in, in Texas right now, and you know maybe in, in 2020 in Texas there's going to be uh, an election or uh, some kind of referendum about marijuana, cannabis legalization, and you want to show people that you know cannabis smokers are, are peaceful and and that we we have initiative and that, that we're courageous enough to put our bodies on the line and to, to smoke marijuana in public to show you know hey we're not gonna we're not gonna obey your law and this is a violent law you're putting peaceful people in jail for smoking a plant you know that might be more efficient I mean you talk about now you're on the news now you know now you got a story that people are talking about now it's now it's an event and people are going wow oh because these people really want an end to marijuana prohibition in the state of Texas. You're going to reach people a lot more efficiently than with a political tour or speeches or direct mail or, or even TV ads. So in that sense, uh, in, in terms of changing people's minds, it's extremely efficient. When it, it comes to the other value of, of civil disobedience, of, of changing laws because you make it untenable, for the government to continue enforcing them, which is really what happened at Jefferson, then it's kind of out of the realm of politics. And, and, and at that point, the, the party archy strategy doesn't apply. And it's one way you can say that the, the, at some times, the party archy strategy is insufficient. When, and and it's, it's tough to say because I would, I would point to many injustices in in the United States today and be like, no, we can't wait for politics. We should have civil disobedience. Like, with, with cannabis prohibition, with, with, you know, thousands of lives still being ruined every day in this country because of that, I'm shocked that we can't get more people to say, fuck the law, I'm going to smoke it anyway. Because this is, this is criminal. What the government is doing in the name of the war on drugs is criminal. And we are going to stand in the way of that. You know, if we had that, if we were at that point in history where we could do that, I would be all in favor of that over politics. And just say, no, it's going to be untenable for the government to enforce any kind of drug laws. But even then, you kind of need the political process, the party party, if you will, to kind of clean up the mess afterwards and say, okay, we're going to change the law so there's no confusion. Is there any, <coughs> excuse me, is there any level of civil disobedience that is too extreme or possibly too insufficient to create a balance? How would you balance your civil disobedience decisions? So you mean like you wouldn't put your life on the line over a jaywalk, jaywalking policy, right? That's what you're saying? That could okay. be too extreme. Would that be too extreme? Yeah, absolutely. And there is a certain thing that you have to acknowledge, and I always have, and I think some people haven't, uh, as, as a civil disobedience activist, which is that you, you are demanding a, a diversion of resources, partly in order to show that it shouldn't happen, but that you are inconveniencing people. So it better be for a darn good reason. You know, when, when Black Lives Matter goes out and blocks freeways and they don't connect it to something specifically that they're doing, you know, maybe they're pissing people off more than they're winning people over. And I say this as someone who has had issues and been, been, you know, assaulted in the name of Black Lives Matter, but, you know, I, I support the basic premise of the movement. Um, so, for the injustices that governments commit on the scale of war, then there's no act of civil disobedience that's too extreme. And, and you just put this in basic terms of justice. Someone is about to be murdered, or a lot of people en masse are about to be murdered. Yeah, it's worth you risking your life to get arrested with the chance that, oh, you might get tased. You know, you might get shot by a cop. Yeah, it's worth you risking your life if you can if you can have that perspective. You know, I mean, I hate to go all, uh, you know, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few on you, but ultimately that's what it comes down to. And as an activist like me, if you're motivated by a deep-seated sense of injustice, 
I can weigh the injustice that I see against my own life. Maybe it's easier for me. I was in the Marines. You know, I risked my life for far less worthy causes before. But if, if, it, if it came down to out of your uniquely in position to, to lay down in front of a military convoy and stop, you know, a, a great war crime from happening, yeah, in a heartbeat, I, I, I would do it. Of course, I'm not going to do that for Jane Walking Law. So, sorry, you're on your own there. Go, 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 write your city council. I think your answer is very loving and easily digestible. This is a reminder for the viewers. Agorism does not support political engagement in the form of political party promotion as a means to transition to a free society. Partyarchism supports the pursuit of a free society ends through political parties via voting. This is a two-part question, Mr. Kokesh. Have you ever refrained from voting for the reason that voting is a construct of government? If so, how do you present the vote importance of voting with an agorist? And if not, how do you present the importance of not voting with a party artist? Sure. Well, for myself, I think I've just not voted out of laziness a handful of times. Uh, but I haven't been allowed to vote now since uh, I became a felon in 2013. It's funny because now I live in Arizona, so I'm I'm allowed to run for president, but I'm an, I'm not allowed to vote for myself in my home state. So you don't have an obligation to vote. There's no commitment. There's no duty. There's no responsibility. I'm not going to play that game. And most of the time, voting is a waste of time. If there's no libertarian on the ballot, if there's no significant ballot measure that's going to change your life, yeah. If you have something better to do, go to something better. But the arguments against voting on principle are wrong. On principle. And one of them is voting is violence. And that's absurd. And, and it's really important, as a, as a libertarian advocating for a philosophy based on universal nonviolence, to say we ascribe responsibility properly. You know, if, if, if you punch me in the face and your brother's cheering you on, I'm not going to hold him responsible. I'm going to hold you responsible. You know, same thing with the with an election. If, if, if a government is committing a crime against me, wronging me, stealing from me in the name of taxation, I can't, you know, go steal back from somebody else because they're a voter who voted for it. No, the crime here is holding an election and forcing the results on people. Voting is an expression of preference. You might be voting to like, yeah, please beat me less, be a nicer, kinder slave master. Sure. And most of the time, yeah, that's a waste. But the other argument is, 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 is one that, that, that I find really, really disturbing, especially from libertarians. And I, I think anybody who makes this argument reveals that they're not a libertarian. And that is that voting legitimizes the state. No amount of voting could possibly legitimize the state. If you think that voting can legitimize the state, you're a statist. Like, you're not a libertarian at that point. No, voting does not give them an excuse to, to do violence against you. They were going to do it anyway, and they're using the voting as, as a means to say, well, we got this authority from the people. And you can take that away. And we are at the point in human history now where they can really only cheat on elections so much. They have exit polls. You know, we have general accountability. We can see, yeah, they can cheat, and yeah, the main thing they do to cheat is keep people off the ballot. But enough libertarians organize and demand to be on the ballot, they can't keep us off. So, you look at marijuana, and I hate to keep going back to this, but as just one example, it was because people came out and voted in state referendums that marijuana, at least at this point now, in the United States, it's, uh, it's so legal that it's not even fun to smoke anymore. So with that, you can see that the people who are making those arguments against participating, you got to question their motives and, and, and question their philosophical ground. Because if they're saying that voting is violence or that it legitimizes the state, then they, they really don't know what they're talking about. Very interesting. <clears throat> are the, I would like to ask you this. Are the means from each social philosophy so different 
that the two cannot work together toward a voluntary society. Oh, definitely right, oh of course not. And, and, I, and I think that's like hopefully the most important thing anybody gets out of this is that if you're trying to ask the question, you know, uh, between what are you guys doing? the between the two, this, are you both well, we're, we're, oh, we're, oh, we're oh, doing oh, it. Oh, sorry, 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 cool. sorry. So, that it's almost like an artificial divide. You know, that, that someone came in, and, and I, and I, I got to hand it to Konkin, because Konkin developing, you know, the, the theory of agorism, you know, gave, gave great form and body to this particular strategic approach. But to say, like, it's this versus this, I think he kind of went wrong with that. And if you just go, no, it's just libertarian, just unite under the idea of libertarianism, then these these strategic divides really become irrelevant. You see, it's it's all synergistic, and it all contributes to moving humanity towards a voluntary society, which most importantly is inevitable. It really doesn't matter what any of us do. This is the natural course of human progress. Nonviolence is better than violence. Cooperation is better than coercion. The market naturally favors freedom, so we're going to get it. Personally, I think you're a very inspirational person. What efforts have you taken to work with agorists or party archists to create a voluntary society? Well, I mean, I'm working with both. Um, I am both. I, I, I really reject the, the divide in terms of, like, identity. You know, like I was saying, everybody's an agorist. Even the most, you know, virulent statists practice agorism in some things in their lives that they want to keep away from government. Um, so I... I, I yeah, I just, I reject this, you know, negative competition between strategies that have to be synergistic. So what I'm doing, obviously, running for president or running to dissolve the federal government specifically, is, is entirely within the realm of politics. And a lot of the activism that I'm doing around and with the campaign is more in the realm of agorism and, and awareness raising, like even uh, the March of the Dead Veterans that we did in, in New Orleans recently, while we're saying end the drug war and give the VA to veterans, which are sort of specific political objectives, to address the issue of veteran suicide, just raising the awareness and letting veterans know, hey, you're not alone in, in, in struggling with issues you're struggling with. That, you know, that's, that's agorism. We're not, we're not waiting for government. We're not waiting for the VA. We're going to get veterans together to help each other directly. So that's that's you know a huge part of it for me. Encouraging people to use cryptocurrency. That's that's. I mean, really, we take away the money racket from government, and you know, most of the rest goes away eventually. So yeah, just and it's a big part of what I promote with the campaign is that you know we should have uh, you know we, we take cryptocurrencies and that when we dissolve the federal government, we might be uh, we might be liquidating it for cryptos, and, and and I hope that that's the dominant currency of the time. So. Yeah, even in my activism, they, they really do go hand in hand. Perfect. In conclusion, what ef what other efforts can others take to work with agorists or party artists to create a voluntary society? I don't know. I think I just gotta like defer to the Ron Paul answer here, which is uh, which is if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. You know, do it do what you enjoy, do what you love, do what makes you happy, because that's increasing the value in your life. Apply the principles, be of a free mind where you're not thinking in someone else's box, that you're able to, to realize your will to the, to the max potential for what is creating value for you and making you happy. Amazing. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Ask a Libertarian Facebook fan page is spreading awareness of libertarianism and informing non-libertarians while empowering those who support liberty on a daily basis. This is your opportunity to be empowered and let us advocate libertarianism for you at facebook.com slash ask a libertarian.